Good morning, Pickens biologists. And uh, this is the final section of the packet uh, that we want to look at for macromolecules and discuss. And um, as we go through this, I do briefly want to remind you that just yesterday, Thursday, February 11th, we completed in class the section on amino acids that were here based on model nine. And that these amino acids are the monomers that make up the proteins. And that in solution within your cells, naturally, these amino acids are going to have opposite ends of these molecules with opposite charges. And so picture for a second, if you will, in solution, one of these amino acids floating around and another amino acid just like it floating around and that the positive end, the amino end or ammonium end of this amino acid could interact with a neighboring carboxylate end of another amino acid. They would be attracted to each other because of those opposite charges that would exist in solution. And so that's gonna make it a little bit easier for these molecules to come together and to actually be able to form the bonds that they go into. And so these amino acids typically, again, have this structure where there's an amine end and a carboxylic acid end, and then there's an R group. And there are, again, 20 common amino acids that are coded for by DNA. And so there will be 20 different R groups that we would be concerned with when we look at these proteins and amino acids in biology. We're not going to have to learn all of those for this class, although we will see all of those mentioned at some point. And so here's the information for this hemoglobin. If you want to read this on your own, go ahead and pause it. Last chance to pause the video. If you are reading this on your own and you want to skip past my reading, please feel free to do so. I'll do a hand sign at the end of the reading. So there are four levels of structure to a protein. So a protein, remember, is a sequence of amino acids. The primary structure of a protein is the amino acid sequence. Amino acids can be written out, like glycine is the simplest amino acid, or they can be abbreviated to three letters. G-L-Y or GLY would be the three-letter abbreviation for glycine or they can abbrevi be abbreviated to only one letter. And for glycine in particular, that one letter would be G. These one letters will not always match the names of all of the amino acids though. Each amino acid has its own unique three letter and one letter abbreviations, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and skip. So here's the hand sign. I'm not done reading yet, but I wanna emphasize what the primary structure is for hemoglobin. So if you look in model 10, you can see here's this image of an amino acid group. And notice that um, there's an N here and a C double O. Well, we don't see the nitrogen next to this carbon double O anywhere in our amino acid model. The only way that could happen is if this N here bonds to this carbon here. And in fact, that can happen through what's called a dehydration reaction where water would be removed. So if two of these hydrogens on the ammonium end of an amino acid in solution react with a negative oxygen from the carboxylate end, then you could remove water. And in that dehydration reaction, you can form a bond. This dehydration reaction, remember, is going to be similar to the dehydration reactions that we see when lipids form. So just like this carboxylic acid here could react with an alcohol group and we could remove a water to form a bond, we are doing the same thing here now in this primary level of structure between neighboring amino acids. We call these peptide bonds. So within this primary structure model that we can see, this right here, commonly this section here, is a peptide bond. 
And in chemistry, we would actually call it an amide functional group or an amide bond. And it is especially strong. In fact, it's these kinds of bonds that hold together the molecules that make Kevlar. And in this box below this model, this is a sequence of one letter abbreviations for the amino acids. And you could look at this sequence and right now, because you know G is glycine, you could look at this sequence and you could identify where all of the glycines are. And those would be all of the Gs. And so I'm gonna go ahead and highlight real quickly all of the Gs. These are all glycines. Glycine is the simplest amino acid. You do not have to memorize this now or anything like that. I think that's all of the glycines that I see. And for glycine, again, you don't have to know this. The R for glycine is just a hydrogen atom. And so if these were both glycines, these R's here and here would both be hydrogens. But all of these different amino acids will have different groups here as the R group instead of a hydrogen, okay? So the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. We can specify those primary structures with the full names of the amino acids, with three-letter abbreviations, or with one-letter abbreviations for especially long proteins, okay? So again, if you want to pause as you read this on your own, I'll give a hand sign again at the end of my reading. Secondary structure is how the protein folds, which we, we would see with beta sheets or coils like alpha helix. Tertiary structure is how the alpha helices and beta sheets fit together within a single protein chain to form the overall shape of the protein. And quaternary structure is when more than one protein comes together and it describes how the subunits fit together to interact. And so here's our hand sign after the reading. Secondary structure is how the sequence of amino acids starts to coil or fold at their um, local level, at the, at the smallest kind of magnification level just past their sequence. And so notice here in this diagram that there are these hydrogen bonds that are being indicated. So depending on what the R groups are, some R groups will be able to interact with other neighboring R groups by the formation of hydrogen bonds. Or perhaps those R groups will have acid or base groups. And if they are acidic or basic, then they can also interact through ionic interactions with other nearby amino acids. Notice that for these two amino acids here to interact within this chain, this chain has to coil around. And so these are not going to be amino acids that are right next to each other in the sequence. They're going to be amino acids that are three or four or maybe even five amino acids away from each other. And so this is an example of an alpha helix. It's an example of secondary structure which is how that protein chain starts to fold, how it starts to coil. When we zoom out more from the secondary structure level, we see the tertiary structure level. This is one whole protein chain here, okay? This whole protein chain is one of the beta subunits of the human protein hemoglobin. This would be known as beta hemoglobin because it's one particular chain. Within hemoglobin, we have an iron, and that iron is responsible for bonding to oxygen and carrying oxygen through our blood, okay? Um, the tertiary structure here, how the overall chain is folded and how the overall chain looks, many times these units can fit together with other protein units, other protein chains. So the actual hemoglobin protein that's in our red blood cells that carries oxygen around is actually a collection of four subunits, four protein chains 
there are two beta chains. These are the lighter grays. And there are two alpha chains. These are the darker grays. And the way all of those bigger um, units, all of those chains fit together is known as the quaternary structure. So notice that primary to quaternary, we're going from small scale, how individual amino acids are connected and what their sequence is, all the way up to the overall structure of a collection of proteins. And so we're going from a small scale up to a big scale, or we're going from micro to macro, okay? And so you want to make sure that you can memorize these levels of structures. So looking at these questions, these questions are just supposed to help emphasize what we see in the model. So the amino acid sequence is an example of which level of structure. So what level of structure do we call the sequence of amino acids? And so there's a clue here in the model that it's the primary structure but we can also see that up here in the text where primary structure is the amino acid sequence. So perhaps we should repeat that. So the amino acid sequence MVLSPAD is an example of primary structure. Now, if you want to abbreviate this, a lot of times people will draw primary as a one with a degree symbol. Stating that a particular section of a protein forms an alpha helix is an example of which level of structure. So if a protein has an alpha helix that alpha helix is an example of secondary structure. Now, I don't want you to get used to going in the order of one, two, three, four. That's not how you're always going to see questions coming at you. So showing that human hemoglobin consists of two alpha subunits and two beta subunits is an example of which level of structure. So the fact that more than one protein comes together and that these alpha and beta subunits, another typo in there, are fitting together in some way, that is an example of quaternary structure. So the idea that there are two beta and two alpha units is an example of quaternary structure. So showing that hemoglobin consists of, and I'm gonna summarize this and say four subunits, rather than stating which ones they are specifically, showing that hemoglobin consists of four subunits is an example of quaternary structure. Quaternary structure. And again, quaternary we could show with a four and a degree symbol. Secondary we could show with two and a degree symbol. And then 62 is a little more open-ended. How would you describe the tertiary structure of a protein? So tertiary is how the alpha helices and beta sheets fit together to form the overall shape of the protein. That's my definition for it. How could you kind of reword that? Maybe you could say that tertiary structure of a protein would describe how many alpha helices or beta sheets were in the protein and would show 
the interactions and locations between those features. So I'm not making it very clear up here how many alpha helices or beta sheets there are, but saying so would be part of this description of the tertiary structure, okay? So these are all of the questions for the protein here. Now, what happens when these protein chains fold in particular ways, what happens when these subunits come together is that some proteins will have little pockets inside of them. And those pockets inside of them can actually help chemical reactions occur. And these proteins, proteins in specific, specifically, these proteins that help chemical reactions happen are often known as enzymes. So enzymes are proteins with active sites, which can catalyze specific chemical reactions. Catalyze means speed up, lower energy requirements, lower energy requirements for specific chemical reactions. Polymerizing RNA, so polymerizing would mean adding on to a polymer, creating that polymer, making it longer. Polymerizing RNA, this would be ribonucleic acid. Cleaving ATP, so someone in class was asking about how the adenosine triphosphate, how it could lose one or two different phosphate groups. Whenever you cut those phosphates off, that would be cleaving ATP or joining saccharides. So when you turn a monosaccharide into a disaccharide, or when you, again, polymerize that into making a longer starch or cellulose molecule, these are all examples of biochemical reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes. Sometimes they can happen on their own, but in the presence of enzymes, you can actually direct these reactions. Even protein synthesis is itself dependent on other proteins working as enzymes. So thinking back to characteristics of life, remember that all life is based on cells. And one of the things we're gonna learn about cells is that all cells come from other cells. And we could even say the same thing here about proteins. All proteins are going to come from other proteins. So without the presence of enzymes, our bodies normally would not be able to synthesize such complex proteins like hemoglobin. Some people talk about enzymes using a lock and key model. So picture a lock and a key that you can stick into it. But an induced fit model is usually a better explanation for how the chemical reactions are catalyzed. So instead, picture someone handing you a fruit and the fruit doesn't quite fit in your hands. So when the fruit comes into your hands, your hands come together a little bit more to hold the fruit and to make it more secure. In that process of changing your, the shape of your hands, maybe you make it easier to open up that fruit, okay? And so likewise with proteins with enzymes that are reacting with something, if those enzymes have to change their shape a little bit, by changing their shape a little bit, they make it a little bit easier to perform the reaction that they are trying to catalyze, okay? Overall, a catalyst actually decreases the activation energy of a chemical reaction. So then model 11 is just simply a chemical reaction, the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So we have hydrogen peroxide, which is in water, it's in aqueous solution, and that hydrogen peroxide will decompose into water molecules and oxygen gas molecules. That water, because it's already in water, would be specified as a liquid, that oxygen would be specified as a gas. Model 12 shows us what's called a reaction coordinate diagram for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Notice that the y-axis represents energy, the x-axis represents reaction progress, and we can see where our reactants start out in terms of energy and where our products end in terms of energy. The mechanism of the reaction is the specific steps that occur to go from the reactants to the products, and the uncatalyzed reaction is going to go through different steps. And so it has a higher hill to, to get over, a higher 
activation energy. The catalyzed reaction has a lower activation energy, okay? So take a look at the questions then. In both models above, what is the reactant in the reaction? In both models, what is the thing that we are starting out with? We are starting out with hydrogen peroxide. So we're starting out with H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. The reactant is, oops, reactant is H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. What are the products? The products are, what are we producing in the reaction? What is our reactant turning into? And it's also labeled on our reaction coordinate diagram. So our products are water and oxygen gas or liquid water and oxygen gas. Okay, what happens to the activation energy for a catalyzed reaction compared to an uncatalyzed reaction? So the activation energy for a catalyzed reaction is smaller than an uncatalyzed reaction. So the EA So the EA, the activation energy for the catalyzed reaction, remember our XN would be reaction, the EA for the catalyzed reaction is less than the uncatalyzed reaction. Uncatalyzed reaction. Does the overall reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide release or require energy? How do you know? So here's our graph. Here's our model 12, the reaction coordinate diagram. Here's energy, increasing energy. How would you say the reactants compare to the products in terms of energy? Hopefully you would say that the reactants are higher than the products in energy. So energy is released. And when energy comes out of a chemical reaction, we would call that exothermic. Exo being out, thermic being related to heat, which then is related to energy. So does the overall reaction for the decomposition release or require energy? The decomposition of H2O2 releases energy because the products are at a lower energy than the reactants. And does adding a catalyst change the amount of energy released by this decomposition? What's the most important thing for seeing how much energy is released when you go from reactants to products? Well, it's just the difference between reactants and products. It doesn't matter what happens up here in this reaction. The difference between reactants and products in terms of energy will always be the same. So does adding a catalyst change the amount of energy released by this decomposition? No, because the energy difference between reactants and products does not change. All right, now this final question is an extremely challenging question. 
I want you to go back over the past three pages. So this page, okay, this page, and this page. And I want you to think about how changing acid-base chemistry, how changing pH might change the behavior of a catalyst. How would adding an acid or a base to an enzyme prevent it from catalyzing a reaction? And you could even go back in this packet as far as the carboxylic acid carboxylate model four. And think about how these things can change as we add acids or add bases into a solution. So go ahead and pause the video and think about that before you come back for an explanation. You really want to pause the video and take some time to think. Last chance to pause. All right, so when you add an acid or when you add a base, so adding an acid, when you add an acid, you're going to be adding H plus. This is going to protonate carboxylates and amines. So our COO minuses are going to pick up H pluses and they're going to turn into carboxylic acid groups. That's going to increase the amount of hydrogen bonds that can form, but it's going to decrease the amount of ionic interactions. Our amines, which are normally like RNH2 and there's a lone pair there on the nitrogen, those are going to be protonated, NH3, with a positive charge. So that's going to take away the lone pair electrons, which is going to decrease the amount of hydrogen bonds that can be accepted. It's going to technically increase the number of hydrogen bonds that could be donated. But then it's also going to increase the number of ionic interactions, because now this becomes positive. But notice that this. H can't donate to this N because this N has full spots. It doesn't have a lone pair anymore, but these H's could be donated to that O. This lone pair here, this could have accepted an H, but when there was a base there, when it was a basic solution, there would have been no H here to be donated. So depending on how much acid or how much base, you might get a blend of different states of these carboxylate, carboxylic acid, or amine, or ammonium groups. This is going to change the intermolecular forces. When you change the intermolecular forces, which can even occur within these levels of structure of a protein, basically you can change all of these higher levels of structure. You can change the quaternary, tertiary, or secondary structure of the protein. You're not gonna change the primary structure because just adding acid or base is not going to break these peptide bonds. But when you change change acid or base, you can change IMF present along the amino acid chain. And disrupt the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure which can change or eliminate these active sites that are in the enzymes. 
So these active sites typically have multiple roles where they're responsible for both holding on to a molecule and they are responsible for adding something or taking something away from that molecule. And so if you change that active site so that it can't serve all of those purposes anymore, then it's not going to be as good at catalyzing a reaction or it might not even be able to catalyze the reaction. So when you change acid base in solution, let's say in solution, you can change the intermolecular forces present along the amino acid chain and disrupt the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure, which can reduce or eliminate the enzyme active site. And without that active site, that protein, that enzyme will not be able to catalyze a reaction. This is it for this video. There will be a second video which will summarize what we've seen so far for both nucleic acids and proteins. And that's gonna be important for the quiz you take on in class on Tuesday.